questions, because otherwise people that wanted recordings would be annoyed at me. Maybe that's working. Cool. Let's get some sight. Groovy. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot for coming down. Uh, Going to be talking uh, mostly about a couple of libraries that I've been developing for a few years. Uh, one called Keppel, one called Varia, which together make uh, coding uh, GL, Lispy, and just feel like it belongs in that language for whatever reason I decided this was a good idea. Um, okay. So basically going through what was, why, why do this? Uh, what it is now, and a bit of live coding, and some of that kind of jazz, and then some retrospectives and what I might do with it. Got to have one of these. Uh, so that's where my stuff is. That's where I talk about some of the stuff. And I've been doing this for a few years, but compared to the language, I'm still a baby. Um, I'm a programmer at Fuse. Uh, we make tools to make the development process and design process of mobile apps not suck. If that's your kind of bag, please come down and talk to us. There's a few guys down the front here and myself. We are hiring and it's cool as shiz. Right. This. How do we get started? Okay, so a lot of this is born out of a frustration of dealing with basically little game engines and stuff when I was, when I was pretty young. And like, often they were scripting and they were things like basic and stuff like this. So it's basic and dark basic. And they were great because... If you, you didn't know anything, but then it would say, oh, this function needs a matrix, and you go, what the fuck's that? Okay, right, find out what that is. That learning curve was really nice. But after a while, you'd hit this point where it was like, you say, how do I do this? And they'd say, oh, that's cool, just learn C++ and DirectX and make DLLs. And I'm like, oh, okay, maybe not. And it was just unfortunate, because that curve had been really nice, and then there was this, like, it's kind of interesting now, but I, I wasn't that interested in learning, like, everything. I just wanted to play and make things that people thought were, were fun. Uh, there was Microsoft XNA, which was cool for a while, and it was C-sharp and kind of nice, but Microsoft did the Microsofty thing and just let it die. Um, and then eventually got to kind of like Python, which seemed really fresh and breezy compared to Java, which I've been doing some of. And um, I looked at how they were doing things, and everything kind of fell into two camps. It would either be write raw GL in Python, which is writing C in Python, and Python's the wrong language to write C in. Or press a button and get a game, which I'd done, and I was sick of that, and I kind of got really jaded over time. Um, so, after a while, I was drinking with one of my mates, and he was going on about the Swahili <coughs> language, because there's a problem, is when you learn Lisp, it's like learning monads, you just have to talk about them too much at places that aren't really appropriate for it. <laughs> um, we'll get back to that. And so, uh, I, got, I eventually got annoyed, I said, just sit it up on my machine, and I'll go have a play, and I came back a broken man, because it was awesome. Uh, there was so much stuff in the language where, like in other languages, there'll be something that's kind of magical and you just kind of accept it. And then in Lisp, it was like, oh, that's magical and weird. But then you can look behind it. And what's behind it is just the same stuff as you're already allowed to use. And that felt really cool. And I kind of, yeah, got stuck in this language. It's awesome. Um, so yeah, Lisp is interesting history-wise, but that's not what I want to talk about in this one. Uh, so we're talking about common Lisp. Um, and what it is nowadays is an eager, dynamically typed, incrementally compiled language. And that last one is the kind of important thing for live coding. You can recompile just a class or a function or a variable, whatever, at runtime. The effects are immediate. And that's really handy, especially if you want to do live coding of GPU stuff. Um, the spec allows it to be compiled or interpreted, uh, which matters back then. Most of the, like, the only version we use are all compiled. Uh, he's just reminding me of a thing. Please get up and get drinks and food during this talk. I actually am more relaxed when people are moving and talking. Ask questions whenever. Uh, yeah, this is weird otherwise. Good man. Right. So, yes, Commander interpreted. So there are some things about the language that are a bit more optional, uh, like declarations. You can tell the compiler types, and you can tell the compiler, hey, this variable should be stack allocated and stuff like that. But it's not obliged to use that information, kind of like inline and C++ and stuff like this. Um, and some of that's just due to separated things. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So there's some cruft and things there. Also, it's got other things that a language should have nowadays. Kick-ass package manager, really nice FFI. Editor integration is awesome if you're on Vim or Emacs, and otherwise it's pretty bad. Um, yes, stuff. And actually, this, like, Lisp obviously <coughs> did come from, like, the early days and academic stuff, but when this was being standardized, it was at the height of the AI bubble. So a load of, they, they, the academics got together to standardize because the DOD had told them to, like, we're not funding everything, make a common Lisp. 
Um, and a, a bunch of industry people turned up because they had made they had made a product and it was shipping. So there was a lot of compromises made that result in Lisp having a lot of practical stuff to it. Common Lisp. Um, I won't speak to the others. Yeah, and then macros, which I'll be yakking about a lot, so I'm not going to go into any more detail here. So yeah, I had a language. What to make with it? Well, I knew I wasn't going to make an engine because I, at this point, like engine had become synonymous with shit I can't <laughs> think past. Like that was always the wall. I actually wanted to learn GL. Uh, I didn't want to, be, but I didn't want to be doing it um, just writing C in the wrong language. So it had to feel like Lisp. It had to feel like it was native to the language. And this is the big arm wavy real stuff. Got to be possible to make real stuff. And what that meant to me was watching some GDC talks and looking at how much, <coughs> how much hard work really smart people were putting in to getting things to run at 60 frames a second and going, well, that means I can't be anal about being pure. So I can't go pure functional. I can't, go, I can't use parts of Lisp that um, I'm not going to be able to optimize at a later date. And so that kind of shaped a lot of the decisions in it. Um, something, wait a second. Something, something live coding. Yeah, right. Um, I had an idea, like, at the time, I was thinking, like, life coding, it's this awesome thing, and it'll make so many things easier because you can just play with ideas until they're done, and, and that'll help. It's gotten more nuanced over the time. It has its own flaws, and I'll try and get to that a little later. For okay, so brief intermission. I'm going to be showing some code, so it kind of made sense to um, prime you a little before I hit you with too many parens. Okay, so... We're going to talk about, if you want to understand what a language is doing, you're understanding the evaluation model. And so that's going to be how it executes code, what's going to happen when things run. Um, this is after the reader done anything. So you've got a bunch of code in a text file, because that's the least worst way of writing code right now. And so the part, which is the reader, is going to write it and turn it into a data structure. Now, because it's Lisp, like in a lot of languages, it'll be some AST that like has its own <coughs> types and you won't see. In Lisp, it's just like, we use the normal Lisp data types. So a list becomes a list, an integer becomes an integer, and you have access to that later. Okay, so the evaluation basics. Most stuff evaluates to itself, which is the kind of simple thing. If you're in Python, you type one in the REPL and hit return, you get the same one back. That's the same here. It's slightly different when we get down to this. So this guy's a symbol. A variable, so it's going to find out what it is bound to foo right now and return that value. So it looks pretty much similar to normal variable stuff. This guy, so if we're going to evaluate code, which is lots of lists, we need to evaluate the list. The rule is really simple. The thing on the left is the name of the function, and then we evaluate each of the arguments from left to right, and then we pass the results to the function bar. Um, so this is exactly the same as the uh, more C-like one on the right. And again, stuff nests, because everything is expressions in Lisp. So this is, um, we're going to look up uh, And yeah, same kind of thing. The thing to point out here is that this guy is just a normal function. There's nothing special about operators. You can call your functions whatever you like. Unicode names are fine, etc. Yeah. Do that, that's fun. <laughs> Everyone loves you when you do that. Um, okay, this is when things get kind of slightly weirder in Lispy. We've already seen what this does. So this is adding two numbers together. But if you stick this little quote in front of it, it's telling it to not... Because your code at this point has been read in, it's not text. So this is going to turn a list with three things in it, the symbol plus, the number 10, and the number 20. And then I'm going to belabor that point with a few. If you take the first thing out of the quoted code, it's that symbol plus. And if you take the second thing out of it, you're going to get 10. So this is so we can get our code and we say, don't evaluate this. And you get it back as data. And you can start screwing with it. Um, and that's going to prove to be useful. OK, and then I'm going to put this in because it's going to appear a little later. This guy's the quasi quote. If you can turn off evaluation, it makes sense to be able to turn it on again. So, but if we use the back tick, then we can use the comma to turn on evaluation again. So the first bit doesn't get evaluated, this guy 
does get evaluated, the thing spliced in. Right, so this is just a, this is basically templates for making lists. And because we're going to be doing code generation, this is actually one of the takeaways. Whatever it is you're using to generate your AST, syntax has got to be super lightweight. It's got to be as small as possible because this stuff gets complicated enough on its own. And unnecessary complication. And that's how all this works entirely. That's the ev evaluation model, except when it isn't. And that's because we have a few cases. And, and the cases that aren't are pretty logical because if we start with like the first one, if, if an if was a function, we would check if the Ruskies are coming, fire the missiles, and then go to sleep. And only after all that was done would we call the function with the result, at which point it's a bit late to stop the missiles. Um, the next one is uh, binding variables. So here it's again a layout, but we're 10, it's foo, and then we're evaluating the body uh, inside this let. So in that case, foo is going to be 10, and so multiply 10 is 100. Simple. Tell me to slow down as well, and we've got a habit of talking too fast. So if that becomes a problem, shout out and get more pizza, because it's pizza. Yes, macros. So tearing through to this point, macros are, yeah, I agree with this quote. Um, macros kind of get lumped in with C macros, and they're very different. We're not operating on the text level. We're already operating once we've got to a data structure, and so it's not possible to break things by just like injecting a paren or a brace in the wrong place and then suddenly your code doesn't work anymore. Like you're already in a data structure, you can't make half of a list. So whatever you're, you're doing here, whenever you're generating code, it's going to be something valid. Um, macros aren't special. All they are is functions. They're functions that are going to work on your code rather than at runtime. Um, but what's interesting about it is not what they do, it's just when they do it. Anything macro you can do in a function. Whoops, there we go. Hooks into the compiler process. So at different points of compilation, you can say, hey, I want to take over for a second and do something. <clears throat> so it might be when the code is being read in from text into the data structure, you can say, hey, if you see a square bracket, I'm going to take over. And then you can pass whatever's in the square brackets and generate whatever data you need. Um, so if you want to add curly braces and square braces to this language. It takes about 10 minutes to do. It's uh, yeah, pretty easy. So there's a few kinds of macro. Uh, the main one that is used most of the time is just called macros, which is just confusing. So I'm just going to call them regular macros at the moment. And they're about the AST transformation step. So your code has been read in. It's in this big data structure now. And then it's going to go through looking for macros to explain. So or is a macro. It's going to transform this code. And so if you think about what OR does, like logically, like it's going to evaluate x, and then if x is not nil, it's going to return x. Otherwise, it's going to evaluate y, and if y is not nil, return y. Otherwise, it's nil. So that's your basically early, early out kind of OR evaluation. And that expands to this, which is no, a little much read. You wouldn't want to write this, but you don't, because that's what macros are for. Um, this is doing exactly what we said. We're going to evaluate x here. We're going to bind it to this temporary variable. If that's not nil, then return it. Otherwise, we evaluate y. If that's not nil, we return that. Otherwise, we return nil. <coughs> so what you write at the top is what you mean, is, well, is what you want to happen. And then the expansion is what that means. And this means that we can take patterns that appear in our code which we see all the time, and just wrap them up. And by doing that, like it, once you've made something a macro, which is just a function, it makes all the libraries, ship them to other people, and then you can try out um, yeah, these kind of transformations in real projects. So you can, get, you can take a project that already has value to you and try out new techniques and uh, see if they actually make sense in the large context. There are, yeah, so some other kinds of macro. One I mentioned before, reader macros. So if you want to add like uh, square braces or curly braces, you can just say, hey, if you see a curly brace, let me take over. It calls your function. It gives you the stream to the file that's being read. And you just start reading characters and return lists. And that, as long as it's valid code, everything's going to be fine. 
Also, because macros are just functions, you can call any function that's already been compiled before you. So you can use yeah, any, any of your dependencies that you've said your library requires on are yours to use. So you can yeah, use pattern matching if you've included a pattern matching at compile time. Uh, compiler macros, they exist to optimize call sites, so like, um, like you do for inlining. Um, the, compile, like the compiler basically gives you control. These are, like reader macros are rarely used. These guys are used more, this is more like if you have a function which has kind of two code paths, a fast path and a slow path, but at, a lot of the time at compile time you might be able to work out which one you could call. So rather than doing that check at runtime, you can spot it and use the compiler macro to replace it with the call to the fast path instead. And this gets used a lot to optimize the crap out of your code, which is really nice. Symbol macros I'm not going to go into, but they also exist. Everyone is still here, and nobody has got more pizza. I don't understand. Um, right. Let's get back to GL. I actually think GL is kind of gorgeous. It's, it's surprisingly nice. It, the model, the model is surprisingly nice. There's some places to store data. Like we've got buffers and textures and we're gonna pull data out of those. We've got views into the data via samplers and VAOs and, and, F, and UBOs and stuff like that. We've got functionality in shaders and ways to compose them, programs. And then we've got like sinks to throw our data into, like the FBOs and render buffers and stuff. There's actually it's quite, there's not much to learn here if this was actually how you were interacting with it. Um, the API itself is not that nice, and I, like, it's one of those things that's kind of known, so I'm not going to belabor the point. Like, I don't like the API, um, so I had to make it feel a little closer to home. But if you squint at this, for, this stuff for a little while, patterns start appearing. So buffers, like VBOs, they're raw bytes, but they always have structure because you're doing things like vertex buffers and streams and things like this. So it's a load of contiguously similarly typed data, which means it's an array. So we have arrays in GPU, in, in GPU buffers, and we have textures, which are structures that hold a bunch of images, but all images are arrays. So we've got two different kinds of array. The only difference is, the only differences are, um, what memory is backing the array, and then how you query data in and out, out of those arrays. So this is something we can abstract over. We can just say, hey, we're gonna have arrays. Um, then we've got VAOs. Um, like the wiki even describes them as streams. Like this is like for defining streams of vertices. VAOs give you a way to define like the layout part of a stream. This is where the data is coming from. This is how the data is organized. So if you add, a, um, add just a length to that, you've got enough information to call things like draw elements. And that's, quite cool. So now we get arrays and we get streams which are just pulling data out of arrays. Sampler objects are kick-ass, there's no reason ever not to use one except for the fact that they're kind of inconvenient sometimes. So if we just make them nice, that's fine, that's done. And FBOs are fucking awesome. So like there's just a bunch of attachments and you slot arrays into the holes and you draw into them. So that should be really cool. Uh, and then it shaders. Like I thought I was going to get away with strings for kind of a while. It's, it's this thing like after doing Lisp for a while, whenever you have data that's in a string, it, it insults you because you have to write a program to get it out. And that's just, I, I, it makes me really angry. Um, so they're kind of viewed as this kind of shitty form of encryption and they don't compose because the strings don't, don't hold the structure of what they represent. They're just a linear thing of characters. So that's annoying. Um, so we're going to have to do something better than that. Also, we want to be able to handle dependencies. Functions are going to call functions. We're going to need to know that. That's something you can't stick in a string. Um, every project, even like the tutorials you look at for GL, end up having some system for doing this kind of shit. So it's obviously a problem. We're going to need something to do with that. But this is just like a block of functionality. We're taking this block of functionality and this one, and we want to compose in some way. And like we have analogies for dealing with blocks of functionality. They're called functions. So let's see, like if we take that analogy and take it seriously, it's like how far can you just get with functions? So the, the first distance you run, difference you run into in shaders is like you've got a main function, you've got regular functions, like other ones. And so what really is the difference between them? And it kind of boils down to how you're defining your arguments, like the, the values coming in and the values coming out. For normal functions, they're just the arguments and then the return type and any out arguments you've got. 
Um, and then for the, uh, the main function, it's your in args and your out args and the uniforms. And like, then you can specify extra metadata as well as types, so it's like centroid or smooth or flat or all that kind of crap. So, but essentially, it's just arguments. And we can, and in Lisp, uh, it supports multiple value return by default. So you can, so we already have something in Lisp that will represent this fine. Pipelines, well, they actually, functions work even better here because you just, a pipeline is just all these composed steps and they're all that seem to be locally mutable, but they're passing values along the line. So this feels like it can work as well. We just need a way of defining functions that are gonna run on the GPU and then composing them together in some way. Just do that. That took years. Anyway, no. Um, are there any advantages to making the pipeline function? Yes! So I'm gonna be, I decided that I was gonna, whatever I was gonna use to compose these GPU functions together, I was gonna be using a macro. And what this was gonna allow me to do is generate a function that would uh, represent the pipeline. So when you call a function, it's going to start the drawing process. Now, because we're generating all this code, we can do things that, uh, for optimizations, we can, we can look at the signatures of the GPU functions and say, okay, these are the arguments and these are the uniforms. And then we can write all the codes, generate all the code for doing all the uniform uploads and all that kind of stuff automatically. And for a, for a um, because it's, backtracking here a bit, because it's also a language that lets you declare types, um, you can put all, just generate all the type information as well and then tell the compiler to optimize the crap out of it and you get really fast code considering it's a dynamically typed language by default. So that was really cool. Um, and then, so how are we gonna use this pipeline? Well, it's a composed function and we have a, a stream of data. So we're gonna map uh, the data over the pipeline. And that's gonna be how we draw things. And then it was syntax. Um, yeah, I didn't expect uh, dealing with the string stuff at first to be as big of a problem. Like switching between Lisp and GLSL was really screwing with my head. It might just be unsimple, but it was just that context switch all the time. I wanted to think about the problem and not about how I was writing the problem. Um, so I just decided to start, yeah, a little translator, which, because I'm looking at that and then that, and you think, that can't be too hard. And, you know, that, uh, that, that took a couple of years out of my life. And that's, um, that's this little compiler called Varia. And it's completely standalone. It doesn't know anything about GL itself. doesn't need a context. All it does is it takes lists and gives you GLSL as a string and a bunch of other data. But it, but it also doesn't try to be too clever. There's, it would be very easy to get really academic and try and, I don't know, like... Like Lisp is dynamically typed, so maybe we can do dynamic dispatch and shaders, but that's just gonna be shit and slow. And I wanted to make real stuff, so I couldn't do that. So it's things like we, like I'll get into some of the uh, things we support. Like we have first class functions, but if you use them, the compiler needs to be able to know at the call site which function it's calling. So you can't just do conditional dispatch firing off functions left and right. But it still turns out to be useful for just composing functionality and as a replacement for kind of like mega, mega shaders where you're normally doing if defs and all this kind of stuff. But yeah, we have type inference. We have, uh, and it can check types between stages. Uh, we have macros, every kind of list macro also works in this compiler. Inline GLSL expressions for things that I haven't got around to fixing yet. Um, you can define GPU functions and structs separately and then use them in your shaders so it can handle dependencies and includes and things. And uh, yeah, declarations, which allow you to attach compile time metadata to values, and the compiler can propagate those around. And then in your macros, you can query that information. So you can say, hey, this vector is in this uh, vector space. And then later in a macro, you can query what that was, and then you can start doing your own kind of static, you can do static analysis on vector spaces, for example, which is fun. But I've been yakking a lot, and I actually want to code something. So, we're gonna do, try and do simple stuff. We're gonna get a little cube up on the screen. And to save you just having to watch me type very badly, um, basically I've got a lot of the code commented out. Everything in green is commented out. And the stuff up the top is what's actually being used so far. So we have um, some, here we have a variable called cubeless data. And what I wanna do is just paste that here. And what it is, is a bunch of lists. This is a load of vertex information, and this is some indices. 
and we're going to want to make a well, we're going to want to make a video, we're going to, and a video, so we're making a stream out of this stuff. Um, and we can see that the vertices are kind of, there's three elements to each vertex. So we have um, a position, which is a vector 3, and a normal, which is a vector 3, and some UVs, which are vector 2. And we'll minimize it, yes, that's definitely the key combination I was going for. Uh, we've got a function, dfun means define function. This is the now function that takes zero arguments and returns the internal real time. Basically, this is going to give us a number that's going up all the time. So if we do now, we can see this is slowly growing from whatever the, for whatever that is. Um, and we have this function here called step demo. So what this means is when I'm on this slide, uh, the software that's doing these slides is then calling this function every frame. So if I go down here and bring the rep up again, and go on here and say print high, uh, you'll see a whole bunch of highs down there. And so that just means that's being called 60 times a second or whatever the projector and gadgets are letting us do. So let's start making this. So we said before that we have some uh, vertices. So what we're going to need is we're going to need a type that we can use both CPU and C uh, GPU side for that data. So first thing we're going to do is going to make a struct. Because if you have those values packed together, you've essentially got a struct in C. So let's represent it as that. So we're going to make this type, this struct called vert pnt. Um, it's got a position, a normal, and a uv. And it's the types of each of those are vector3, vector3, and vector2. And they have little accessors. This is the name of the function that if I call, I'm going to get the value back from the struct. So that's compiled. Now, anytime you see a flash like that, that's me compiling something. Um, so that's now in the system, that's running. Um, we're also going to want a variable to stick the GPU stream in. So that's that guy, better compile him. And then we're going to have a function with a lot more parens than we've been having to deal with so far. That's this guy. Okay, so I'm going to just go through this. The first thing we're going to do is, let's bring up the REPL again quickly. Oh yeah, let's invert the screen. Cool. Right, so we have this vertex data, which was two lists of stuff. One list containing all the vertices, one containing the indices. So we're going to destructure that data into verts and indices, and then we're going to make two GPU arrays. One, called, one taking the verts data, one taking the indices data, and the types here are the type we just defined, and unsigned short. And so then we're going to have these two GPU arrays, which we're going to make a buffer stream out of. Um, so this is how we take list data, this is how we upload data to uh, the GPU into VDOs and then make a VAO, which is the stream. And so what we have to do now is if we call make stream, and we will get something visual soon that you can start believing me and I'm not just talking complete shit. We get back a buffer stream here. And I'm just going to go and put that into the the variable. Oh, the uh, weird stars at the beginning and the end of uh, variable names? That's a Lisp convention for global variables. Uh, they call them earmuffs. I don't. Yes. Right. Cubestream. That one. If we inspect this, you know what, I'll, I'll come back to that later. But um, this is the object. It has, the 5 is the GLID. So that's, that's that. We've got a length of 36 and its index. And so we're going to use this object in a second. Right, now we really need to see something or people are going to start leaving. So we are going to make the graphics pipeline. So we are going to define a couple of GPU functions. The difference between defining a normal list function and a GPU function is that that is called defun and that one's called defun G. So we've got the G on the end, we're talking GPU now. And it takes one vertex from that type we defined up here, and then it's querying the values out of it. So it's going to take the position and the normal and the UV and return all those values from this. So we're essentially just unpacking the vertex. And then we're going to uh, have another GPU function, which is going to take the normal and the UV, and that's vector 3 and vector 2. And then uh, this uh, V exclamation, exclamation mark? Um, is for making vectors. So this is a vector 4, which is just red. 
So this, this fragment shader is just going to return red. Now, at the moment, these are just GPU functions. They can be used for anything, but then we're going to tell, um, we're going to create a pipeline, and then these two are going to be used for the vertex and fragment shader. The fact they're called vert and frag doesn't mean anything, it's just so it's easier for, to remember for me. I have a quick question. Yes! Um, just like the, how the, the bits sort of fit together. Um, yep. Like, so the, the output of the function for the vertex shader, yeah. is it, so it looks like it returns multiple values. Yes. Am I reading that right? Yep. Okay. This says return three values. Yeah. This one's a vector four, this one's a vector three, and a vector two. Right. So, so because it's a, a vertex shader, I forgot to mention this, so thanks for catching me out on that one. The first value returned from a vertex shader is going to be GL position. So that's going to be taken away, and it's any of them afterwards get passed on to the fragment shader. That's exactly what I was going to ask. So then all the all the inputs to the fragment shader there, you see, there's just two of them because your yep. position isn't normally yeah. passed that way. You'd have to explicitly have it, and then you have the yeah. Okay, that was spot good. on. That's the one. Um, and this this uh, G pipe down here is stolen from Haskell because I thought it was cute. Um, we're going to make a pipeline. Which is a function called draw thing, and this is going to be used as the vertex shader, and this is going to be used as the fragment shader. This is just us having to qualify, like, because we can have um, overloading of functions, um, we have to specify the signatures there. Now, essentially, we have it all we need to draw, so we're going to, um, whoops, map the cube stream that we made before over the pipeline. And then we have the worst cube in the world. Because it's a rectangle, because everything's squashed up, we need to handle perspective and stuff like that. And it, <laughs> yes, sarcastic applause, thank you. And we need to handle perspective and shit like that. So let's rotate it. It wasn't meant to be sarcastic. <laughs> you're just you are. Pissing on yourself. <laughs> oh no, it, it, you're talking, which means it's going to be sarcastic. Yeah, that's <laughs> right, so. I should make clear to the stream, I know the guy who's talking. I'm not just insulting people that have had the decency to come along. Um, okay, so we are going to make a variable called rot. It's going to be our rotation. It's a vector 3. And then every frame, we're going to update it. Let's put this in the step. Get the annotation right. Um, so now, if we go and look at rot, we should see a uh, vector 3 that's changing over time. So that should be useful. And now what we need to do is we need to make a rotation matrix. Well, we're going to need to make a transform matrix for our cube. So this is another block of stuff. So all I'm doing is I'm getting the viewport that this is being rendered in so I can get the size of it. Um, I'm making a rotation matrix, a matrix 4, from the rotation variable. I'm making a translation matrix from this vector, so minus three, move it back a little. And then we're taking, we're creating a perspective matrix which takes the size of the viewport, uh, the near plane, the far plane, and the angle. And currently nothing's happening because we need to go and update our fragment shader. Let's do and uniform, nope, not the fragment shader. You don't transform vertices in a fragment shader. Make a uniform. And we're going to call this, what's the name of the other one down here? Model to clip. There we go. Model to clip. And it's going to be a matrix 4. And every time I re uh, recompile, this is generating new GLSL. So if I go and compile frag and then go to the REPL, we can do pull G frag. And that didn't work because I need to fix something. Anyway, yeah we get the GLSL code back. That what was generated by the compiler. So let's finish this off. I'm just going to speed through this thing. We've got a matrix, so we want to multiply that by these guys. And then when I compile it, it's going to complain because it says it can't multiply a matrix 4 and a vector 3, which is fine. So this needs to be a vector 4. When I compile that, it's going to complain that the output types from my shader are now incorrect. Let's put that down here because that was just difficult to deal with. Little DB. The output types of the stage are not compatible with the input arguments of the next. Because this guy is now a vector 4, and this expects a vector 3. 
So let's just swizzle that. Oops. Swizzle. XYZ. And then say continue. And nothing's happening. Because we still need to upload that matrix. So if we go down to map G, we can then specify the stuff. And that is a really fast spinning cube. So um, if we just go up to now, we're just going to fuck with this value. So let's just make it less. And that could be a cube. But it's kind of hard to tell because everything's red. So let's make a local variable that's going to represent our light. Well, where our light is. And then we're going to do this really nasty, like the worst shading in the world. Let's just do clamp dot the light with the normal and then clip that from zero to one and then like ooh but yes that kind of works and then well let's put a little 0 0.2 there so we can pretend it's ambient light and we're not fucking everything up so yeah like we've got it's kind of hard to see actually but um but yeah we've got a cube there where we can make it into a disturbing green or something and it'd be slightly more visible yeah so We've gone from pretty much nothing to uh, getting a cube up on the screen, but it's still pretty boring to look at, so it's going to need a texture. <clears throat> now, there's a really nice library called Soil, which you can use for loading images into textures. And we have a little wrapper around that called Dirt. And so if you do load image to texture, and then you just oh, lisp talk what, we have a texture. And if we use the inspector that's built in, we can see a, f a little bit of information about this. We can see that it, what it's based, the dimensions of the base texture, we can see the type, the image format, the number of mitmap levels it's got, and stuff like this. And so all these things are supported, but there just isn't time to go through it all. Making a texture is really simple, even when you're not loading it in. You can just call make texture and give it some data. And it, the more information you give it, the faster path it can use. Um, but if you just take here some data, it's going to look at the types of data and see what the smallest one that is that's valid. So here it's managed to work out that it's a 1D texture and the image format should be R8 because this is, you know, like unsigned, unsigned byte or whatever it can all fit into. And it has one mitmap level, things like that. But I'm getting distracted now. So let's go make a variable for our texture. Right, and cube text. So now we should have that there. We're also going to need, because we have to work from samplers, we're going to need a variable for our sampler. And we're going to make the sampler just by calling sample on the texture. So if we do sample, whoops, yeah, let's switch. Uh, there we go. And now, this is a 2D sampler that's sampling from that texture. And you can, there's all kinds of settings that you can set in there, but for right now, we're just going to go and use it. So, where were we? We have a fragment shader, which is going to need another uniform, and it's going to be called SAM, and it's going to be a sampler 2D. And then we want to go and upload this. So we can say sound, cube sampler. And now that's already uploading. And then it should be as simple as saying texture, sound, with the UVs we've already got. And we have a texture cube. Boom! Right. But one of the things we might want to look at is the kind of things you can do with samplers. So let's just go and oversample slightly here with, let's just multiply the UVs by two. And now we should be getting tiled, um, tiled images on this. But we might not want it to use repeat, which is the default here. So let's go look at that sampler again. Cube sampler. And then just look at the wrap for cube sampler. Um, and we can see that it's set to repeat in all dimensions. So what we can do is we can just go and change that. So if we want to clamp to edge, and because all this stuff is actually written out in Lisp, 
we get auto completion, so clamp to edge. And now we can see that effect has taken, taken on a medium. So we have all the stuff that GL has. It's just been a case of trying to get it into um, functions that are reasonably easy to call from the REPL. And, and one of the rules has just been, anytime you create something, never return it in a valid state. So no matter how little data you give it, you should either throw an exception and say, what? Or give you something valid. Um, and it kind of works hard to do that. But if you give it all the information, then it should go fast and just do exactly what you said. Right, now we're going to leave... Oh, actually, I'm going to change this back to repeat. And we're going to come back to this guy in a minute. But I wanted to look a little at blur kernels. Because I thought, like, like blur kernels and stuff were kind of cool. Every time I, like, and I looked them up just to get the basic idea. And this was really... Like, really explained it well. It's like, hey, you're going to read a color and multiply it by, say, eight, and then you're going to read all of its neighbor texels, and you're going to multiply them by minus one, and you're going to add them together. This is a really clean way of representing that operation. Um, and then you look up the code, and the code's pretty simple. I mean, I know it's a bit small here, but I mean, like, there's not much to it. It's fairly easy to understand, but it's not as easy as that which is the actual kernel itself. So it would be really nice if we just could write the kernel, like just the numbers, and compile that instead and just get the function. Because if something is trivial and tedious, we write programs to fix it. And the same goes for your code. Just write a little program to generate it. It's, so this is, this is the syntax we're going to want here. We're going to have def kernel. We're going to give it a name and potentially give it, say, whether it's normalized or not, some arguments there. And then we just want to write the numbers. And we want that to kind of just work. It's going to generate something like this, a GPU function where we shove a name in, which will be KH, then some arguments. We're just going to define this as the API. So it's going to take a texture and the UVs and then a vector 2, which says where the next texel is, and then the body. So now we need to work out what the body is. So how these basically work when we were looking at the grid before. You make a call to texture to sample a color. We multiply it by whatever the number in the grid is, and we do that with all of the numbers in the grid and add them all together, which is basically this, plus a bunch of stuff. Unless you need to normalize it, uh, which was the case for this guy, the, the uh, Gaussian down the b bottom, where you're meant to be dividing it by uh, 256, which is the sum of all these. So when we normalize, we want to take all the stuff we've added together and then just divide it by the sum of all the weights. But again, this is trivial. We can write code to do this. Uh, so let's go and uncomment this code and pretend that it's live coding. Um, so one dot lisp. I've been even... <laughs> what? Um, He's commenting on your own commenting. I like this recursion. Um, I've gone ahead and just written it because Watching me write a larger block of code will be tedious, but if I just go back over to the slides here, we can see a bit of it. Right, we can see some of the patterns. We wanted a defung G where we specified some name and a body and we had some arguments. So that's this bit here. Let's make that slightly bigger. That is too much bigger. There we go. Come on, Chris, don't lose it now. There we are. Cool. So we're going to make a list which starts with defung g, which is what we needed, and splices in some name using that quasi quote thing that I mentioned earlier, just taking the name from here. So basically, when the compiler comes along and sees def kernel, it's going to call this, which is just a function. And it is the arguments it's going to pass in the code. So name is going to be k edge, and normalize is going to be nil in this case, and the weights is just going to be a list of all these numbers. And so we're going to generate deep on G with a name and a body. So now we need to work out what the body's going to be, which we had already decided over here was going to either be adding a load of stuff together. So we're going to add a load of samples, or we're going to divide a bunch of samples by the sum of all the weights. And the way we do that is like the samples are just uh, generated here. And it's a bit kind of ugly. This is a for each loop that's going over those numbers 
and it's just making lists, which are saying multiply, and a quarter <coughs> texture, and the weights. It's actually just easier if I go up here and uncomment this, and compile it, and then macro expand. So this is the code that gets generated for that kernel. Let's change the orientation here. So this is exactly what we're after. We, want, we get a GPU function, we've spliced in a name, and then we've got a load of calls to texture. This is actually easier to read than the old GLSL was from the other slide, and it does the same thing. And it's kind of nice that when you can go up to something and you can interact with this guy however you like, but then you can expand to see what it actually means. So let's, let's actually see what we've got now. So if we go to demo one, we are down here, we've got step demo again. It's the same as before, it's being called every frame. Let's make our little render pipeline. In this case, we're gonna be doing a full screen quad, and then we're gonna be calling one of the uh, kernels that I've got down here. Let's uncomment all of these. These are all the comments, the kernels from that first slide. So we've got an identity kernel, one that apparently does edge, uh, edge detection, one that does sharpening, and one that does a little bit of blur. And that's compiled, and that's compiled. I'm just gonna drop in the map G, because we don't need to belabor that point anymore. Okay, so we have something drawing. And at the moment, the fragment shader is just calling KID, uh, which is this little kernel down here. <clears throat> And the nice thing is because our macro just generates GPU functions, um, we get live coding for free. So we're just, we can just mess around with things here and see what effect it starts having. That's kind of interesting Then we start getting edges. Or we can do sharpen. Now I'm really interested to see if this actually shows up at all. You can tell me if this is even visible. Is that slightly sharper to you? Yeah. Cool then it's visible. Yeah, it's really subtle, and then the question would be, why did it sharpen so little? So then you'd start have that question to go, a better question to ask when you go back to the internet and try and find things out. Again, same goes with uh, Gaussian, the slightly bigger one. In this case, we're saying normalize. So if we look at the code that's generated, it has the divide. Ta-da! Magic. So let's go and call that from our fragment shader. And then every time we do this, it's just doing a bunch of work. It's going make sure all the dependencies are up to date and generating the GSL, uploading that to the GPU, generating all the programs, handling all the uniform uploads. And it's tiny. Okay, so apparently that's slightly blurrier. Again, probably. But the nice one is actually the edge of detection. So we get hard to see where's, where's the button of power. There we go. Yes! <laughs> we can see that it has edges. And so now we've got a little kernel that can detect edges. I want to use that on the cube that we had a minute ago, which means we need to render to an FBO, and then we need to run that FBO on this. So let's see if we can hack that together real fast. So I'm going to go back to this guy, and then I'm going to need to render to an FBO. So I need an FBO, so we'll make a variable for it. And then we're going to call make FBO. Now, I need to know what the size of the FBO is going to be, like what size the textures should be inside the FBO. So I'm going to just do a really hacky thing here. I'm going to, whoops, type things wrong. I'm going to come down here, and I'm just going to say print the current viewport. That like VB is currently bound to the viewport. And I'll take that out, and when I go back to the REPL, I should see, oh, why isn't that there? VP. Oh, it's VP. Oh, I know why. Because I'm on the wrong slide. Let's go back to uh, to our box. So now it's being called, hopefully. And then we go here. Yes, there's a load of stuff. So we can see the viewport from our highly scientific method was this guy. So that's the dimensions. Sweet. So now let's make an FBO. Now make FBO again. Like if you give it no arguments, wah. Well, It'll freak out on you when you say continue. Um, you can give it very few arguments. You can say, hey, I want an attachment at zero and a depth 
attachment, and it will go and make them. It'll look at the current viewport to work out what the size of the texture should be. It'll give it decent. It'll create the textures. <coughs> it'll give them decent formats, and it will bind all that up. So you can always just create one. We're going to do it slightly differently because we need correct sizes, not element type, dimensions. So we're going to use the dimensions we just worked out. Wow. And hopefully, we'll have an FBO. Yes. Cube FBO. And then we want to capture things. So we have, let's have a look at that FBO quickly. FBOs are cool. Like, if you can type FBO properly, they're really cool. Nope. Not like that either. Cube FBO. Come on. There we go. Right. They, they have a number of attachments. So we can query the attachment of the Cube FBO. We'll take the zeroth attachment, and we can see that it's an array. So this is what we were talking about before. We can have arrays that are backed by texture data. And there's the size, and there's the kind of element type that we're using. And so, um, again, we're just seeing that that really simple model works in a number of places. And we can also check out the depth attachment. And we can see here that it's picked depth component 24 as the type, and stuff like that. Right, I'm going to speed this along a bit with FBO bound. And then we're just going to give it the FBO. I'm going to look up the documentation because I can't remember my own API. Yes. And all we do is we wrap the call to map G, like the mapping over the pipeline. We just wrap it in with FBO bound. And then it's going to disappear. <laughs> Not if you can't write your code properly. Cube FBO, sorry. That's going to disappear because we're no longer drawing to the default FBO, we're drawing into the FBO we just made. So now we need to draw it. So if we went back to here, all we're going to do is we're going to steal the map G for calling uh, applying kernel. We're going to paste that here. And if we do that, we get that. But we need to swap out this texture. So we need to go and get the texture from that FBO. Uh, so how are we going to do that? We get the attachment from the FBO, and then we, we have a GPU array. So we want to get the texture that, that GPU array belongs to. And that's that texture. And then we're going to need a cube FBO sampler. Oops. Set of Cube, why are you picking long names when you're trying to give a demonstration? Sampler. Um, and we're going to sample that texture that we just saw. And apparently now we've got a sampler to the texture in the FBO. And at that point, we should just be able to pass that to here. And it's horrible! Because we don't clear our FBO at the beginning of the frame. And once we do that, we get edge detection. Hooray! So that's that. Cool. So, again, playing around, we kind of go from nothing to basically it's just being able to play with ideas, not just in GLSL from something like Shader Toy, which is kick ass, but also on the OpenGL side down the CPU, messing around with things. Now, I'm. Let's jump back over here. Right. We've done this guy. This was going to be another demo. Uh, it was mainly because I was doing some physically based rendering stuff. And um, I was happy that I got it working. And then I realized I really don't have time to talk about this. And it's just the same stuff you've seen, but bigger and, and more things. So this is only here to please me. Um, and then I'll do that. So let's turn on the lights again, and we'll just get to the ending. Like, this, <laughs> this is clearly not the way to learn GL. This is a way to learn how to make this stuff, whatever this is. Uh, so my, my like first failure from all of this is still not whatever a graphics programmer is. I'm not one of them. Um, I have some tools I love playing it with now, but that's not the same. So that was a takeaway. Don't do this unless you want experience in the wrong thing. Um, the other thing was I had a, a hatred against engines, and that's calmed down a bit. It was a good. It was it was a fair thing to be annoyed at because it shaped the API and it made sure everything wasn't too connected together. Um, but an engine really is just a bunch of decisions that somebody made. Whether it's you or whether it's some other company, it's just a bunch of decisions that you're following. So to an extent, 
I should have chilled out a bit on that. But again, I still believe there's a lot, that if, if people spent the time to think that they could separate some of these things more, we could have more just kick-ass libraries um, and they could play together in an interesting way. Especially we could do code generation, you can do some really cool stuff there. Live coding, I got way hung up on this and I still love live coding, clearly I'm still doing this kind of stuff. But it's an approach, it's just, it's not a single technology. There isn't something, oh, we've got live coding now, everything's great. Um, because there's, there's real balances uh, that come under this. I mean, say, like, live coding for a performance and this kind of live coding, I mean, this stuff I'm doing is cool, and it is live, but that is not how you want to perform, right? That took way too long to do simple stuff. So you want bigger building blocks you can connect together in really safe ways that just can't screw up. Um, and that's, again, a different kind of language. This is fairly low level. I mean, like, we're directly talking about GL concepts, even though they're wrapped up. So we can build higher level things on top of this, and it'll, again, just work. It'll just have all the live coding stuff already. So there's some things to take away there. Content is still an absolute bitch. Like, this is way, way harder than any of the other stuff, is getting data that matters. And this is something that MATLAB just nailed, because it's like, Hey, you're going to do, you, you want to talk about stuff about populations where here's every population for the last 200 years. You can start doing maths on real numbers and get data that actually means something. And that's really hard with, uh, but it still feels like as a community in general, we could do this better because it isn't about language or about library. Like this is about data and, and we should be able to categorize that and have a package manager so we don't have to go to things like Turbo Squid and download terrible models. Um, also, I'd like to know which ones have PBR textures made already. Um, API consequences of live coding. Like, this stuff matters. One of the things, I was making a little game in this stuff a little while ago, and I was like, okay, it's a load of uh, little planets flying around, at the, like, and you bump into them and you make yourself into a bigger planet. So at the, I, I thought, how am I going to do the levels? I'll make them like plain old data. It's just going to be a list that describes what planets are flying around. That's, that's like, oh, really pure and really nice. It's just data. And then we'll have a function at the beginning of the level that instantiates all these objects based on that. That's also pure, no mutation, everything that we like. Except it sucked, because as soon as you change that data and recompile, nothing happened. Because the values weren't connected together, you had to restart the level to have an effect. And that's the same recompile loop, just at a different level. It's really easy to make these, so like, there are design decisions that matter if you're serious about live coding. Yeah, I had to throw this in there. Dynamically typed stuff, really beneficial in a lot of places. Um, but it does have its issues when building with large, like just doing larger projects becomes difficult sometimes. But that's also something that's fixable. Uh, yeah. Um, this is one of those things, this is a project that actually could have an end. Um, like it's meant to be GL, so it shouldn't grow too far. So Keppel, and Viro, it's, the Keppel itself should stop at some point. So I've got to keep fleshing that out. There are some things, there's plenty of things that are missing. But anything you can do with modern GL that isn't in Keppel is a bug. So there's a bug that stencils aren't supported right now, for example. Varia, I need to learn how real compilers are made. Uh, I need to learn about type systems a bit more. So I'd love to go back and make that better. Um, and then just more surrounding libraries, more stuff for making things. Um, type systems, I want to do some, because we have access at compile time for generating code, we could type check code then as well. Um, <laughs> there's, uh, yeah, making stuff to explore live coding some more. That's pretty much it. Thank you for sticking with me. And if there is time for questions, we'll take questions. If not, beer. What now? Who wants to break that silence? Is it uh, easy to like, install and just get started? Uh, uh, yeah, it's all in the commonless package manager. So you just do QL, quick load, capital, and it will mm -hmm. come down. Yeah, the soil bindings for commonless, are they included in SQL, or was this something you just have? Uh, no, they're, they're, um, they're in the package manager as well. They're, oh, uh, oh they're, okay. yeah, it uses the FFI to talk to them. Yeah. How usable is this for a small project? Are there um, bugs or is it there's are still bugs. Usable? <laughs> yeah, usable. I mean, I've had, there are people that are using it. There's a guy who's doing like a, um, a compositor for Wayland in this because he's mad. And uh, there's some, a guy in South Korea who's using a compiler for his audiovisual stuff. 
<laughs> in Lisp. But it, it's, yeah, I'm always happy to answer questions online. So if you run into any issues, uh, just, yeah, drop me a line. Go again, yeah, please. I wanted to use, is it possible to use tessellation shaders or compute shaders? Or? Technically, it should be. I haven't done that yet. So I, like, it, the compiler should support it. But I don't know how well that's working because I just don't know how to do them there. But um, if you have examples like I'd like to do this, then I can test the compiler better. That'd be sweet. Also, we I didn't show it, but you can have uh, you can make a, a shader stage which is just plain GLSL on a string, and then you can recompile. You can change just the GLSL itself. When you recompile that, it does all the same stuff. So we can do that. Any more for any more? No? Cool. Thanks a lot. Oh, is there a hand? A small hand. Yeah, because I, I just forgot how to say the word. Can you just do it? Yeah, no problem. No problem. Because I, actually I really wonder how this is going to be applied. Mm -hmm. Because as you showed me, like join uh, Q, actually mm -hmm. many other languages is really easy. Like Matlab yeah. can do it faster. Yes. So like, so what's the point in doing this? Partly it's fun. Like I, I just, I wanted something that was that was low level, but that was addressing the GL AP, the GL concepts and not the API. Um, there's like, to be honest, if you're using this, it's because you want to do graphics in Lisp, and this, in my view, is probably the better way of doing that so far. And if you wanted to experiment with doing high level abstractions, it's kind of to you. I mean, like. It's common, like it's common list. It's a brilliant language, but it's not like super relevant now. So I mean, there's, I don't know. It's it's up to you. I think it would just be you want to do some Lisp would be the answer to that. Yeah, then, then my next question is like, have you ever think about to, to use this kind of method in reverse engineer? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I. Yeah, like I mean, uh, you could use this for doing visualizations of data and stuff like that. Um, not, not so exactly like uh, visual, uh, like normally if we want to like re reverse engineer, I'm not sure if this is the right one, because uh, now what I know, uh, actually uh, Lisp is, 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 is original for artificial intelligence. It's yeah, like, well, it was, uh, is that correct? yeah, pretty much, like, it was uh, kind of a, a elegant Turing machine that actually you could stand using, um, and but the academics didn't care about it being a practical Turing machine, and it just kind of it just kind of grew. But um, there's nothing implicitly about that. To be honest, Common Lisp is just a programming language. There's nothing magic about it, but it has some really cool tools in it. So if you're interested in being able to easily mess around with code, I, I think for like just having a conversation with your compiler and getting things done, I think it's amazing. But I'm not sure. Because I was wondering, like, for example, if now I just want to make a, a data of the chair, and then I have some like tool to to gather the object. Yeah. And then to then you make the texture on it to make like a visible. Yeah, chair. totally. Well, that's it. Like a lot of the scanning devices. Yeah. Yeah, like you would have an interesting data format. So in that case, it probably makes sense to have a tool where you can easily play with stuff and and get there. I mean, I'm biased on this kind of stuff, so I mean, uh, but um, yeah, that would be interesting. The other thing, it's easy to wrap up libraries that already exist in C, like really easy. So um, it's kind of easy just to talk to that library and then pull all that in. Uh, that's what I do a lot of the time. But happy to talk about them more offline. I mean, yeah, work out, yeah, okay. how to import that. How, uh, how big is the library itself or the two libraries that you made? I have no idea. Like, what, lines of code or something? Yeah, like, um, I don't know. Too many. But I mean, like, uh, we can we can look it up. But I mean, like, yeah, quite a few. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it, it definitely it definitely could get smaller than it is right now. Some of the some of the bloat is just because I'm not trying to be like I'm trying to be performant in some places rather than elegant. And so, yeah. Is it is it all this bright until you get down to like the GL? Uh, oh yeah, or? yeah. It's, it's Lisp, and then it's C in yeah. a few places. Like, mm. like um, Keppel can run on uh, SDL or 
um, some other other kind of hosting libraries and stuff like this, or Wayland or things like mm. that. So they act as a host. You just pull in, you load up Keppel, and you just pull in the host that you want, and say Keppel run or Keppel Rappel. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's a lot. Sweet. Thank Thanks, you. folks. Uh, Let's press some buttons. Some more pizza. Yes. Uh, we usually add up 